This week on Animal Miracles, a champion cunning horse goes blind and only a miracle could give him a second chance. Then, a police officer saves an abandoned puppy. What about the dog? Whatever, I don't care. He done for himself. Only to have the favor return many years later. But first, when a fire destroys this family home, everyone escapes except three-year-old Alex. Alex! Alex! I ask God, give me a miracle. Give me something. Nothing strikes fear into our hearts like the threat of fire. When the life of a small child is at stake, the potential for disaster becomes overwhelming. For the family in our next story, only a miracle stands between a simple loss of property and the thought of losing their three-year-old boy. Robert Schlink is a former firefighter who lives near his daughter and son-in-law in Connecticut. He loves that his three-year-old grandson, Alex, and his dog, Misty, are unusually close. She does things different. She, she never barked. And when we brought her to see Alex, uh, there was like this unbelievable bonding between the two of them. My grandson has autism, and she doesn't speak or bark. Autistic children have great difficulty interacting with people. But with Misty, there was something special. It was amazing that between the two of them, even though either one could talk, their communication between each other amazed all of us. One night in July of 1999, that bond would mean the difference between life and death. Alex's mother, Kim, had just come home from the hospital with his new baby brother, Joshua. So I was having spinal headaches. So when we came home, I basically took a lot of medicine and went to bed. Alex and his father, Brian, were watching television in the living room. That night, we brought Joshua home from the hospital. Okay, he was three days old, and we were very tired. I was watching Alex, and we were both watching a movie on the couch. Alex's grandfather and Misty were in the basement. I had fallen asleep. Misty was alongside of me. Brian fell asleep too. Then disaster struck. A faulty electrical outlet started a fire. The room began to fill with smoke and the fire spread. I remember getting woken up by uh, the television exploding. There was smoke everywhere. Alex! But Alex was gone. Fire. Come on, you gotta get up. Where's Alex? I don't know, I can't find him. What do you mean you can't find him? My first thought was to get my wife and the kids out of the house safely and as quickly as possible. What I did was I got Joshua and I got Kim and I got them outside. They went outside and I ran back in the house and I looked for Alex. I was terrified uh, of the fire. Um, I didn't know what to do. Uh, I had a pretty much like a panic attack. I couldn't think straight because I couldn't find Alex. Brian's panicked cries woke Robert. Alex! Something was happening above my head on the first floor. Alex! Tremendous commotion. Uh, I heard people yelling, people running around, uh, people screaming. I had no idea at that time what could be happening. What? The living room's on fire. Is everybody else? No, I can't find the baby or Alex, but I can't find Alex. Okay, you gotta find him. Okay. I had to find Alex. I screamed his name Alex. as loud as I could. And I know Alex can't talk, but I heard him cry. Robert couldn't find Alex, but his 30 years as a fireman told him he might be able to buy some time. So I ran and grabbed the garden hose. 
and my only thought was to try and keep the fire from racing up the stairs. Even if Alex went down, he's small enough to be below the smoke, it would give us time to resuscitate him, hopefully. The smoke in the house was unreal. I mean, you couldn't even see your hand in front of you unless you were on the ground and crawling around. As the fire trucks arrived, Robert suddenly remembered Misty. She was locked in the basement. I grabbed her in my arms. She was as confused as I was, and we ran her outside because now the firefighters were there. She was struggling in my arms. The firefighters wouldn't let them back in the house, but Misty kept pulling toward the burning building. She seemed desperate to go back inside. Alex was in the house for quite a long time. Most people are gonna be overcome because of common monoxide poisoning. And even if you're alive and the common monoxide has overtaken your oxygen, then your survival rate is even lower, even if they get you out of the house until they get immediate oxygen on you. The whole lower floor is burned out. We know that the reality of somebody with that much smoke and that much heat in a house, uh, their time on this earth had been limited. I was worried. I was in tears when I was outside waiting for Alex, you know. I was crying. I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. When I was just watching the house, I just thought they were going to bring my son out and he wasn't going to be moving. And I asked God, give me a miracle. Give me something. Through everything, Misty kept pulling. Finally, she broke free and ran back into the house. Why was she running back into the house? We had to get her out. She lunged at one of the firemen, trying to get his attention, then ran deeper into the inferno. Risking his own life, Robert was frantic to find Misty and Alex. Well, I knew the cellar door was still closed, so she didn't go that way. I tried to make the dining room, but the smoke was so thick, it was below the table level. I couldn't see anything. So I got on my belly as low as I could. I crawled into the room, and I looked around the room frantically. I know the firefighters had been through there, and no one had ever saw anything. The smoke was so low that it, it was total dark. I couldn't see anybody, but I saw this little orange collar. And there under the table was Misty, and she had Alex, and all I could see was his little eyes gleaming at me. I cannot describe to you, I cannot describe to anybody. What that was at that point in time. So I just screamed at the top of my lungs that I have Alex. Misty's found Alex. Give me the boy. We've got to get out. I heard everybody outside screaming. I think they were clapping. Finally, the whole family was safe. They couldn't believe the horror they had just been through. A child lost in a house thick with smoke. No one could have found Alex except Misty. Misty saved Alex. She was smart enough to know that he was still in the house and where he was. Robert's prayer was answered, thanks to Misty and her mysterious connection to Alex. Misty is the miracle. She's just a big angel. I thought that Misty was wonderful. Without her, I could have lost my child. Misty was that something. She was the miracle. <laughs> she was given to us with an intent and a purpose. She's not a dog anymore. She's a family member. She's as important to us as any other person in this family. And we will never forget what she did. When this champion cutting horse goes blind, she can see only one option. She would have to put him down. I didn't feel like there was any choice. I mean, he was completely blind. He was standing in his stall, and, and he was scared. Only love, hard work, and trust can save him. Good boy, good boy, good boy. 
Some of our best stories are about people who overcome disabilities. They show us the endless possibilities within each of us, but what about a horse that goes blind? Well, with the miracle of a little love and attention, you'll be amazed at what this brave creature accomplished. When Linda Northrup Keeter bought a foal sired by a famous cutting horse, she hoped for a winner, and she got one. That's how you turn the cow. Step up there. They named him Bud, and with her husband John's help, they easily taught him the difficult moves required to separate or cut one animal from a herd. Some of the moves they make, I'm sure the good Lord never intended a horse to move like that. This is Bud at one of the many cutting competitions he won. By age nine, he ranked 14th in the country. That's when Linda noticed something terribly wrong. It was right after the nationals in Jackson, Mississippi that I noticed a cloudiness over both eyes. Bud had moon blindness, a little understood virus that creates scar tissue in horses' eyes. Linda took Bud to one veterinary ophthalmologist after another, but found no cure. You don't know when to draw the line and give up because you don't want that thought in the back of your mind, well, if I'd have tried this or if I'd have tried that, maybe it would have worked. Come on, Bud. Walk. Walk, Bud. Good boy, Bud. Good boy. Eventually, Bud's eyes became so sensitive to light that the only time he could go outside was at night. Linda was heartbroken. It was hard to see him in pain. I watched for his good days and his bad days and was there with the painkillers. Horses depend on sight for almost all of their sensory perception. Linda thought a horse without eyes would be like a bird without wings. I just didn't think there would be much of a life for a blind horse. All they could do would be to stand around out in the pasture and listen to their world go by. And I just didn't think any horse could be that happy. First one eye collapsed and then the other, plunging the terrified horse into complete darkness. <laughs> Linda loved Bud, but she felt there was only one thing to do. She would have to put him down. I didn't feel like there was any choice. I mean, he was completely blind. He was standing in his stall and, and he was scared. So I called. Dr. Maltman and, and called a, a friend of mine that has a backhoe and asked him to come out and get the job done. And and they said, yeah, they'd be right out. Veterinarian Kim Maltman knew that most horses never get over the loss of their sight. But she had an inspiration. Perhaps Linda could be Bud's guide. I told Linda to give him a try because Bud and Linda were so well connected. They are like what I described as soulmates. And he was so calm and trusting of her, more than most horses are with, with most of their owners. But Linda remembered Bud as he was and knew he was miserable. She agreed to give it just three days. We'll give it a little bit of time. I got a feeling it's going to be OK. I don't want to lose him. After three days of soul searching, Linda realized that she had to give Bud a chance. And every day that I kept him alive, I felt guilt that I was doing the wrong thing. But yet I couldn't give up in case we could make something of it all. But day after day, I just kept working with him. Good boy. And just by sheer trial and error, I started teaching him step up and step okay. down. And that kind of seemed to step build up, his confidence, step too. Step up, step up. Good boy, good boy. Good boy, good boy, all right, good boy. Linda became excited about pushing the limits of what Bud could do. If he could understand two simple commands, step up and step down, then he should be able to understand anything. Good boy, 
To Linda's surprise, another transformation had taken place. Bud used to be a working horse that hated being fussed over, but now his connection to Linda was deeper than ever. We were growing. <laughs> we were just growing and growing and growing. And, and he was now an affectionate horse. He was now the horse I'd been wanting all along. Bud progressed so well that there became only one more thing to do, ride him. So with John by her side, Linda climbed back up on her one-time cutting champion for the first time in four years. Sitting in Bud's saddle was amazing, but again she wondered how far could Bud go. John suggested she try riding solo. I'm ashamed to say it now, but I was scared of him. After all the bravery he had showed me, you know, leading him here and leading him there and, and teaching him all those things, I was actually scared of him. I was afraid that he would trip and fall and that I would get hurt. Or I was afraid that, that I would scare him and he wouldn't want to do it. You ready to try it on your own? But Linda felt she owed it to Bud to at least let him try. John unhooked the lunge line and I walked him and walked him and walked him and John says, go ahead, trot him, trot him, just try it. And I asked him for a trot and he went right into it without hesitation. I, I was amazed. I, I started crying. I couldn't believe he could do it. I, I was just amazed that he was willing to even try. Bud was calm, completely trusting Linda to be his eyes. Linda was terrified, but Bud's confidence in her was reassuring. And I thought, I mean, there's no way he would canter. And I squeezed him up into the canter, and he never missed a step. He just went right into the canter. Then I had to get off the horse. I was crying too hard. <laughs> to get back on him and ride him again, what well, was an answer to three years of praying? Be a day I'll never forget. Look straight at home as you come around that barrel, you get halfway there. Soon Linda discovered that Bud has another talent. He's the perfect horse for her 11-year-old granddaughter, Michaela, to practice on. Since Bud is blind, he always does exactly what she asks of him. Today, Linda teaches many children to ride on Bud, but that's not all. Amazingly, he even teaches the kids how to handle a cutting horse, and he loves every minute of it. Linda's love for this animal is so strong that that's what has kept him going. There aren't many people that are this dedicated to an animal. And yet, and in return, I think he is as dedicated to her. Through Bud, Linda learned that life's possibilities are endless. Love, hard work, and faith in each other can truly work miracles. I have the world's most superior horse because he not just does it for me, he will do it for anybody. He just trusts that if you're up there, you won't get him into trouble. I'm with him every day, and I still can't believe that there's such a horse that exists. Next, a freak accident sends a man who can't swim deep into a pond. I was going to die. I had to accept it because it, it beat me. Was there any hope at all? When you adopt an unwanted pet, you're probably saving its life. To a doomed and hopeless animal, that makes you a miracle. Many pet owners believe that rescued animals know it and are grateful for the rest of their lives. In this next story, that seems to be true. When one man saves an abandoned puppy's life, only to have the favor returned many years later. You have the right to remain silent and refuse any questions. Do you understand? Yeah. It was a successful day for Officer Rainy Guay. He made an arrest without trouble, but there was one loose end. A helpless puppy tied to his stake. 
What about the dog? Whatever, I don't care. <clears throat> can fend for himself. The first thing I thought when I saw the little pup there was that this little guy stood absolutely no chance of uh, surviving very long. That part of the woods over there are loaded with coyotes and fox. Rainey took the puppy with him, planning to find him a good home, but he found himself quickly becoming attached. Eleven years later, Rainey retired from the force and still had the dog. He called him Tucker. If you give a dog 100% of your time or your care, he'll give you 150%. They'll always outmatch you. They were a good pair. On Rainey's large property in northern Maine, there was land for Tucker to roam and even a natural pond. But Rainey didn't share Tucker's love of the water. He had never learned how to swim. When I was a child, I had always had ear infections. I've always had a tremendous amount of respect for the water, but I never had the fear. All that changed in June of 97. I had started the day off by uh, picking rocks out of my yard. I got a bright idea that I could use these rocks to make a splash where the spring comes into the pond. While Rainey filled his trailer with the heavy rocks, Tucker was on the porch trying to stay dry. It never even dawned on me before how much weight I had in the back of that trailer until the, at that point I suddenly felt the weight of the rocks dragging myself in the tractor backwards. It started sucking me in the tractor back towards the water. By now, the momentum was so strong, the brakes were useless. I remember trying to climb up over it, and I couldn't. Though all of this happened real quickly, it seems like everything was in slow motion. Rainey was desperate. He had never been in water over his head before, and he couldn't swim a stroke. His only hope was the tractor, and it was quickly sinking. I was on one of the front tires, and uh, I was hoping that for some reason it was going to stay there, but it didn't. It kept going, and I, I was on my own. Rainey started swallowing water, and he panicked. It took every effort I had just to stay up in one position. I remember screaming at the top of my lungs. Help! 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 But nobody heard me. The more he struggled, the more he kept going under. I was totally exhausted. I was choking. I was taking in a lot of water. I couldn't talk or scream or yell or anything. The feeling at the point of giving up, it's a very, very strange feeling. When I had accepted the fact that I was gonna die, the fear was gone. I had to accept it because it, it beat me, and I knew it. Rainey wondered if anyone would ever know what had happened to him. I remember having that fear too, is being in the bottom of that pond and nobody ever finding me. But he hadn't counted on Tucker. He heard Rainey's cries and came running. But was it too late? Everything was a total blur. And I remember batting my eyes, and then I saw Tucker standing on the shore. When he started stepping the water towards me, it was just like night and day, from accepting the fact that you're gonna die to seeing a little golden angel coming towards you to save you. Tucker swam around Rainey and then pulled up beside him. I had grabbed some fur on his, on his back end. I was scared to take him down with me. I didn't want to do that to my dog. That fear gave me that much more reason and uh, incentive to work harder and to help him help me. I didn't want to draw my Tucker to him. The faithful dog was determined. He swam with all his strength. As tiny as he is, he, he was just like a locomotive pulling me. With Tucker's help, Rainey finally reached the shore he thought he'd never touch again. When we got to the bank, he, I was still hanging on. 
And he was trying to pull me up the, uh, up the bank, and he couldn't. There was just too much weight for him. So I let go, and I started getting myself up by pulling on the grass. But Rainey's lungs were full of water. My lungs were hurting pretty bad. I did think I was, I was gonna die right there on the lawn. Finally, Rainey coughed it up and took his first clean breath of air. That's when Tucker did something Rainey had never seen before. Tucker came and lay down next to me and started shaking like a leaf. And it's not because it was a cold day, because it wasn't a cold day. Once I was able to uh, get to the point where I was breathing, I hung on to Tucker for dear life. Tucker seemed to know exactly how close he'd come to losing the man who'd once saved his life. Rainey will always be grateful to Tucker for what he did. He had been pulled back from the brink of death by a dog he almost gave away. If Tucker wouldn't have been there that day, I would have died. There's no doubt in my mind. And not only would I have died, but I think it would have been quite a while before anybody would have found me, because I think that's the last place on earth anybody would have ever looked. Today, Tucker and Rainey are safe, healthy and closer friends than ever. They recognize how much they always meant to each other. I don't think you should treat an animal more special because they saved your life. I think you should treat an animal special every day of the year. Coming up. An unlikely bond forms between a medical research gym and a gruff former rancher. I guess I believe that everyone gets to meet a soulmate, and I think that, um, I think Tom is probably Pat's soulmate, and vice versa. There's no creature on Earth more like us than the chimpanzee. 98% of their genetic code is identical to ours. And that's why chimpanzees have been used in medical experiments for decades. In our next story, we'll meet a group of people devoted to giving something back to these animals who have done so much for the quality of human life. Tom's a long way from home. Born in Africa, he was brought to the United States when he was young to be used in medical research. For many research chimps, the lab is the end of the road. Others, like Tom, are left alive but traumatized by decades of medical experiments. But Tom was relatively lucky. He's one of 15 chimpanzees who were retired to the Fauna Foundation Sanctuary, a home for neglected and abused animals outside Montreal, Canada. One of the employees there is Pat Ring, a former cattle rancher. Three years ago, when he was told about the arriving chimps, he was new at the foundation and he was worried. Tom. Tom. The chimp was 200 pounds, 250 pounds, had the strength of it. Eight men could pick up 1,000 pounds with one arm. It was like, whoa, this is, you're out of your mind. There ain't no way that we're going to be able to contain these. Pat was accustomed to working with more docile animals. He's a big boy. I was kind of a redneck before. I had beef cattle. Cattle were just. It was an animal, it was a product. Aaron Ketter from the Fauna Foundation remembers how Pat first dealt with the chimps. You saw someone who still tried to use the kinds of methods he would use with, say, the cows. So he'd be calling them in a way that I think sort of made us cringe. Tom, I'm Pat. But Pat became fascinated by how human-like the chimps were, and we one in friends? particular intrigued him. Are we going to be friends? I was told from the lab that uh, when we'll be Tom friends. first arrived that not to trust them, not to trust any chimp, especially a male chimp, an adult chimp. We were told don't go near with fingers, you could lose a finger if they could grab you. But Tom seemed so in need of attention that Pat couldn't help talking to him. And we tried to mix him with other chimps and he would just didn't get along. Good boy. Since leaving Africa, Tom had rarely been with his own kind. Most of his 30 years as a research chimp were spent enduring countless injections and biopsies. He had been anesthetized over 300 times. Tom had even been injected with HIV. 
Many of the other chimps shared similarly bleak histories. As a result, they were in a constant state of anxiety, often expressing it in violent rages. When they first arrived, you couldn't walk into the building without there being chaos. There was screaming, there was banging, there was rocking, the chimps were pulling their hair out. They're terrified to have you go near them. When you do get a little close, they're reaching out and trying to hurt you, which I thought was just mean at first, but when you look at them and you see what's being done to them, you understand it. it's, they're fighting back. But as the chimps adjusted to their new retirement home, they began to calm down. At least here, they were safe. Still, the staff knew that they could never let the chimps out of the cages or go in, as they were still wild animals, and yet they lacked the skills to survive on their own. So it would be up to Pat and the Fauna Foundation staff to care for Tom and the others for the rest of their days. He just has them eyes that are, he's calling for help. It's, I don't know how to explain it. Come here. Move your table up. Good boy. In spite of Tom's long history of suffering at the hands of humans and Pat's previous occupation, even the cages couldn't prevent the connection that was forming between them. When Tom looked at me like that, I was very, very surprised for the way I felt about him. And I'm not a kind of a person that's real soft, kind of, or at least they tell me I'm kind of hard, but um, I just have this spot for Tommy. I just had that gut feeling, I guess you could say. It was something between us that just was there. Okay. <laughs> He's a good boy. As the unspoken bond grew, Pat decided to offer some of his usual afternoon tea to Tom. I brought Tedley tea, my favorite tea, and I poured him some and made it, and he sat there and he drank his tea with me, and then the, that's the only tea he'll drink of. Is it good tea? Yeah. It's kind of like me, I only drink that too. <laughs> What's he doing? Is it good? As the months turned into years, the chimps became healthier and happier. Tom and Pat became best friends. Our trust has grown greatly in three years. And I think I could do just about anything, but I don't believe Tommy would ever hurt me. This bond between man and chimp is even more profound considering Tom is HIV positive. He had been infected with 10,000 times a lethal, lethal dose for a human. But Pat's eyes have been opened to some facts he never knew. I mean, I was totally ignorant to HIV virus and what was going on and I started reading on it and learned that it's only blood to blood contact but now here's somebody you love and it's like there's nothing to be scared of about it Tommy can touch me or hold me and give me a kiss it's I'm not gonna get the virus I think it's mutual love I see Tom as a not as a chimp everybody says it's my brother and they'll mix up and call me me Tom and him Pat and it's but hey I'm proud of that <laughs> Although Pat realizes that this is the best place for Tom now, he wishes that things could have been different for his friend. I mean, I'm not an animal rights activist, but I believe animals have their rights. And I also believe that chimps that are wild or animals that are wild, whether it be elephants or anything, should be left in the wild. But at least they have found each other. In spite of all the horrible things Tom has endured, he will live out his old age knowing that someone truly loves him. And that's a blessing to be wished upon us all. And the scary part is I'm starting to learn the champ language. <laughs> I was, my granddaughter, she was small. And I was standing there and I was playing with her and I was going, <laughs> I realized what I was doing. It was, oh my God, I'm turning champ. But I guess I believe that everyone gets to meet a soulmate. And I think that, um, I think Tom is probably Pat's soulmate, and vice versa. He's loving, he's caring, he's very, very forgiving. I think the miracle in this story is that after you've had some of these chimps out of the lab, that they could be as loving as they are and trust people again. It's, if we had that same kind of trust and forgiveness, this world would be a much better place.
Coming up next, an electric shock leaves a woman stranded in a snowstorm. No one hears her cries for help, except Kayla. All alone, Kayla is helpless as the woman passes out and is buried by the snow. Imagine a young woman unconscious and buried in a snowbank, and no one even knows she's missing. Nobody has ever needed a miracle more than she did in our next true story. Hey, Gail! Randy! Gail Coleman was always happy to run into Randy Foley and his great Dane, Kayla. Next door neighbors for years, they had grown close. It was nice knowing that you had somebody next door that you were honestly happy to have there. You could always count on Kayla for a big wet doggy kisses. She was certainly not a shy animal. That wasn't always the case. Years ago, Kayla was near death when she was rescued from an abusive household. Kayla had a few broken ribs. Uh, she had bruises everywhere on her body. There was a dog that was just a shell of what I knew she really was inside. But Randy nursed her back to health, and now they are inseparable. In early January 1996, Gail and Randy's Massachusetts neighborhood had been hit by a series of violent blizzards. And another one was building fast. It was cold, very, very cold, and windy. And we had approximately two feet of snow still on the ground. After a long day working as a nanny, Gail was relieved to be snug at home in the six-unit house she lived in and managed. No sooner had she sat down when she noticed the back porch light go out. I was responsible for making sure that the walkways were lit. I had changed that bulb, that particular one, many times. Never had a problem. I reached up and was holding on to one of the supports on the porch and I went to take the old bulb out. A powerful electric shock threw her backwards off the porch. It was straight down, probably 10 or 12 feet. The last thing I remember is just falling. The impact knocked Gail out. The blizzard was reaching its peak and no one could see her in the snowbank behind the house. When I woke up, I specifically remember the snow at that point. And cold so intense that after a while, I mean, you're not sure if you're still feeling things. Gail was also suffering stabbing pain from the fall, and she couldn't move. It did take a little while to fully come around and recall what I was doing there and how I had gotten there. It was pretty scary, not knowing, I think, how long I was out there. But her weakened cries were lost in the howling wind. Not being found was a very scary thought. No one could hear Gail's cries for help. Her neighbor Randy wasn't even home. But dogs have better hearing than people, and Kayla heard a muffled cry. <coughs> but there was nothing she could do. Exposed to the full brunt of the blizzard for over an hour, Gail began to suffer from hypothermia. The cold was killing Gail. Her heart had slowed down and her body temperature was now dangerously low. The wind and snow were quickly burying her. We'll be right back with this story's dramatic conclusion. When Gail Coleman went outside in a snowstorm, a terrible shock threw her off her porch. She was in too much pain to move, and no one could hear her cries for help. Except Kayla, alone in the house next door. Gail fell unconscious and was completely buried by the storm. Without help, she would soon be dead. By the time the storm had passed, she was encased in an icy tomb. Usually when I would get home, I mean, Kayla would greet me, jumping on my shoulders and kissing. This night was totally different. Kayla almost never barked, so this behavior was very strange. We always use the front entrance, but this time she was very antsy on going out that back way. I thought she just had to go do her duty. Randy let the dog out and thought that was the end of it. 
but Kayla flew to the gate separating Randy's house from Gail's. She was backing up the stop. I saw Kayla acting just like something was really on her mind and she was trying in the worst way to say something to me. Randy went outside to see why Kayla might be so upset. I looked over the fence and all I saw was a big four foot high snow drift. I saw nothing else and started back in the house. At that point she howled. I had never heard that before. And I wow, I was taken aback by that. Randy took another look, but again, nothing. But Kayla was insistent. She just ran straight into that snowbank. I didn't know what she was trying to find in there. I just knew that she couldn't get there fast enough. Then Randy spotted something buried in the snowbank that made his heart drop, human hair. I was frightened. That was the first thing that I felt was being um, in a bit of shock, too. Uh, I knew that someone was laying in that snowbank. Randy raced to join Kayla. The first thing I noticed was that I just saw blue. I discovered it was my neighbor, Gail Coleman. Randy was astonished to find that Gail was breathing, barely. I immediately ran in the house to grab my cordless phone, and I grabbed a couple of comforters. It was only then that Randy realized the dog who never leaves his side had stayed with Gail. When I came out of the house, Kayla was licking Gail in the face. It almost looked like that she was licking the ice from around the mouth and around the nose, actually helping Gail breathe. It was very extraordinary. I'd never seen anything like it in my life, to be honest with you. Gail started to regain consciousness. Yeah, I've got a lady frozen in the snow. I could see her there, kind of in and out, but always right there in, at some point in my field of vision. Knowing Kayla was there made me hopeful. I wasn't alone. But Gail's breathing was still labored and shallow. Finally, the ambulance arrived. I can remember just being so glad and knowing that now that this was over, this, it's over, I'm going to be out of here. And they told me that another 10 minutes, uh, Gail probably wouldn't have made it. I don't think anybody would have found Gail for a week if Kayla did not know what was going on here and didn't alert me to the situation. Gail had a couple of broken ribs, but eventually recovered completely. She never felt luckier. If it wasn't for the miracle of Kayla, she wouldn't be alive today. I believe Kayla had a sense that something was wrong. It's definitely a, a sense that I don't understand, but I'm grateful for. I just really believe that Kayla heard the cries for help and knew nobody came to those cries. And maybe because of the abuse in life that she had prior to that and her own cries never being answered, I think there was a, a sense of something that Kayla really you know, held on to, and I believe that had a lot to do with you know, the connection there and going out and, and rescuing Gail. I'm incredibly grateful to Kayla. She's always going to have a special place in my heart. She's a very special dog. That's our show for today. Thanks for joining us. We hope that if you are ever in need, the animals in your life will perform miracles for you, too. I'm Alan Thicke, and we'll see you next time. Right, Maggie? That's a good.